Welcome to Meet the Partner Special Series, Saving Lives with Trauma-Informed Practice. My name is Merlene Tucker, and I'm here with my colleague, Kathy Piazza. Together, we'll be running this Dialogue for Health web forum. Thank you to our partners for today's event, the National Overdose Prevention Network, the Center for Health Leadership and Practice, and the Public Health Institute. And now, it's my pleasure to introduce today's guest, Brooke Brigantz. Brooke comes from a multi-sector background in health, direct impact programming for children, youth and families, and public education nonprofit work. She is the program director for the Cypress Resilience Project and deputy director of Faces for the Future Coalition, both projects of the Public Health Institute. She's a certified trainer in trauma-informed systems and practice. Welcome, Brooke. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marlene. I really appreciate that introduction. Um, I'm wondering if everyone can do me a favor in the in the Q&A or in the chat and um, just sort of let me know where where you are, like what location you're in, and maybe something that you're interested in about trauma-informed practice. Um, I'll, I'll keep an eye on that as we go forward, and it just helps me make sure that I'm addressing all of the um, questions and the interests in areas in the room. Um, plus, I just like to know where is everybody coming from? Oh, awesome. Oh, Su Richmond. Very cool. Baltimore. Awesome. So just in that Q&A, San Francisco, substance use disorder. Okay. Oh, we've got, um, we have FACES students at San Francisco General Laurel. So that's awesome. Very cool. Uh, Vegas. Great. Uh, public health in Indianapolis. Oh, very cool. I, I really appreciate everybody taking a minute to do this. It just helps me sort of orient myself. This little Zoom world we're in seems a little strange sometimes. So I appreciate everybody uh, taking a minute to, to indulge my interest areas. Um, I, you know, I have been, as, as Merlene said, I have been working in trauma-informed practice for some time. I'm also a certified instructor in mental health first aid in all of its forms and a grief recovery specialist. And so I've been actively training throughout the pandemic and on Zoom. And um, I, I hope to make this interactive. So I, I, it's not going to throw me off my game if you've got a question or anything like that. So please just go ahead and let me know as questions or interest areas pop up for you. Um, that always makes sure that we're addressing your, your um, concerns or the questions that you have. But also, if you've got that question, probably somebody else does too. So it's always just helpful um, to, to create that group uh, and learning community. That's what we're here for. Um, oh, okay. All right, Marissa, thank you for that. I really appreciate that. Um, you know, absolutely, Jackie, we'll talk about systems today. So a lot of our conversation is going to be focused on systems. This is going to be a part of a three-part series. And so um, we're going to do a deeper dive in some of these areas when we get part to parts two and three. And at the end of our session today, we'll give you those dates so you can register for those sessions if you're interested. Um, we'll talk more about, for instance, the neurobiology of toxic stress management and, and do a deeper dive on some of the things we're sort of brushing on today. Today, I wanted to start out, though, with a little bit of an overview and really a conversation about systems. Um, we all are part of some kind of system, right? And, uh, you know, we know that as we reopen, um, our systems are going to be interacting with the public um, who, you know, have been going through so much during the course of this year. And so what are some things that we need to keep in mind in terms of our systems practice? So our organizations, um, our groups, the cultures of those organizations, how can we make them trauma informed? Even, even better, frankly, moving from trauma-informed to healing and transformative. So trauma-informed is step one. That means we just have common language. We know what we're looking for. We're making effort. But really, ultimately, our goal is to have organizations that are accepting of all people who are um, inclusive, who are celebrating diversity, and who are trauma-informed in practice to the point that they can actually be healing for people. So for example, if I'm managing 
toxic stress at home in my environment, or maybe I'm a young one and I'm dealing with a lot of childhood adversity, what does my school look like? right? What does my clinic look like where I go to access care? And so I really want to be thinking about systems. And we know um, that many of what we're calling those secondary impacts to COVID are really quite serious. So we know we're seeing pretty significant into upticks in things like anxiety, depression, um, absolutely concerns around suicide, thoughts of suicide, absolutely overdose, which is how we're here today. And so what are the ways in which systems and organizations play a role in helping to prevent? That's really our goal today. So I'm going to share my screen and we're going to start with just sort of a little bit of a background um, where we can sort of think about, uh, you know, what are some things that we should all have just as common language. The very first thing that I want to do is to let you know where this curriculum is coming from. So um, I was trained in trauma-informed systems work. Uh, that really came out of San Francisco. It was a partnership with San Francisco um, Unified School District, UCSF, and the San Francisco Department of Public Health. I live in the East Bay, um, and so in the East Bay of the San Francisco Bay Area, um, I was trained as a trainer um, and a, a trauma-informed systems specialist with Alameda County. So just so you know the origin of the things that we're talking about here today. Our, our overarching goal for the day is, it sounds simple, but it's really quite complex and we'll see that uh, relatively quickly. Um, but really what we're looking for are organizations that foster our wellness and resilience for everyone in the communities that we serve. Um, it, you know, I named my organization Cypress Resilience Project. And a lot of times, you know, people get this um, misguided sort of assumption that resilience is the goal. Everyone has inherent resilience, right? We get, you know, we get knocked down, we get back up. We get knocked down, we get back up. Families have inherent resilience. Communities have inherent resilience. The concept is how do we leverage that internal resilience to get to post-traumatic growth and healing? And, you know, the, the great news about post-traumatic growth is that it's 65 to 68 percent of people who go through trauma also experience post-traumatic growth, which means this was very difficult. It was really hard. Um, it came with a lot of pain. It, you know, it, it was definitely a life event. And they come out the other side more aligned with core values, feeling stronger, being able to, um, you know, draw boundaries, uh, being able to relearn trust, really building off of the inherent neuroplasticity we have in our brains to relearn some of those things. And so really what we're looking for is wellness and healing for everyone. And we think that systems can play a role in that. So what do we want to do today, knowing that this is kind of a three-part series? Well, we've, we've got to look at some understanding of basic language. Uh, one of the things we want to make sure to do is that we're using common terminology. We have a shared mental model of what um, trauma is, what it isn't, and we've got some, you know, some commonality there. Of course, we want to think about neurobiology, right? How are brains actually acting in spaces and in relationship with one another? Um, there's some, you know, there's obviously a lot of impact that we have on each other biologically. I, I spent 10 years of my life in a department of neurology as a patient advocate. And um, I, I'm still a little bit of a neuro nerd. I love to learn more about the brain and we learn more every day. So that's very exciting. Um, we can use what we learn to create policies and procedures and systems that help support the healing of the brain, that help support the neuroplasticity of the brain. And so that's very, very exciting. The more we learn about the brain, the more we can make sure that we are addressing that in systems and policies. 
And of course, we have to think about community trauma. We have to acknowledge and bring into the space how the toxic stress response works for some people differently than others. And so we're going to talk about historical trauma, intergenerational trauma, um, and the reality of what are now called adverse community environments or adverse community experiences. And so that has to be brought into the room because many of our systems, if they are still rooted in inequity, are going to activate that stress response for some people differently than others. And that's not fair. So what, what are some things that we want to sort of start out with as almost like our touchstones, right? I think of these as kind of the touchstones of the work, the things that I always want to keep in the center of whatever we're talking about. Well, one of the things is we've really got to normalize, we've got to destigmatize. Um, and, I, you know, COVID is helping us do that, isn't it? Um, you know, where maybe trauma before was a, a them thing and it not an us thing. I hate to tell it, everybody here, but we've all been going through a really significant collective trauma and more importantly, a series of collective traumas. So we have, um, as a nation, as a community of a nation, have been through many things over the course of the last 12 months um, that have exacerbated our own stresses. And so even if we have been safe, even if we have not been directly impacted by COVID, we are still managing more toxic stress than we were before. So one of the things we want to do is normalize talking about this and destigmatize um, the experience of trauma. It's not a them problem. This is an us problem. The other thing we're always wanting to do is to reframe and empower people. Um, you know, I have a trauma background. I make no, you know, I, I don't hide that. It's part of the reason why I'm so passionate about the work. And, you know, learning about how the brain works, understanding, um, you know, the repercussions of the impact of trauma on neurobiology, decision making, relationships is the most freeing thing in the world because many people who experience trauma don't know where behaviors are coming from. Their body is reacting, they may not understand that, and it can be incredibly disorienting. So one of the things we want to do is empower people and empower communities with these conversations, even though we know they are sensitive, even though we know they can be difficult, we want to empower people to understand how brains work so that they can make different decisions moving forward, including things like managing their own toxic stress and, and knowing how to do that really well. Let's see, uh, one of the things that we want to know um, is, uh, you know, how, what, how, what is the impact of trauma? So we know that absolutely trauma has a negative impact on our overall health. Trauma is directly related to the six leading causes of death, things like hypertension, diabetes, right? Um, autoimmune disease. These are very, very deeply rooted in trauma. We also know that trauma is very directly related to um, mental health challenges and substance use. And so for our purposes here, um, it's sort of, to me, is like, it's the bell that once it rung, I couldn't unhear it. It's the thing once I saw it, I can't unsee it because it's so deeply rooted in health outcomes and in equities. And the social determinants of health, trauma is one of them. Um, and so one of the things that we have to think about is um, what, are, what are the long-term implications of trauma? What are the long-term implications on health outcomes for folks, um, both on the individual level and in communities? And so a systems approach to taking um, trauma as a public health concern is incredibly important because we know that it has such strong statistical ties to other health outcomes that we're watching. I want to be very clear in case there are some providers in the room. Um, we are not talking about trauma treatment right now. Um, we know that there are certain treatments that a, an individual, a family, et cetera, can access that are very, very specific. You see some here. 
what we're talking about is trauma-informed practice. And it's important to distinguish between the two because we don't want to supplant trauma treatment for trauma practice. If someone needs treatment, one of the things that trauma-informed practice can do is to destigmatize the accessing of that treatment. Um, but we know that trauma-informed practice has more to do with interpersonal communication skills. It has to do with the types of policies and procedures we may have put in place. It even may have to do with what the waiting room looks like. Um, do, do I walk into this waiting room and feel welcomed? Um, are there images of me in the waiting room? Do I feel as though I can be myself in this space? I, I think very much of trauma-informed spaces and trauma-informed um, sort of environments as being welcoming. What are the things I have to do as someone in a system to ensure that every time someone walks in my door, they feel as though this is a safe space. We'll talk a little bit more about safety in particular in a little bit, um, but we know that safety is key in, in capitalizing on that neuroplasticity or the brain's ability to hear because we know there's a direct relationship between safe relationships and safe environments and healing from trauma. But I wanna be very clear that trauma-informed practice does not supplant trauma-informed treatment. So, uh, you know, we absolutely know that what we do matters. <laughs> and, and, and I know that sounds maybe like a, a kind of a silly thing to say, um, but we know that what we do matters. And that means that our decisions from workforce, um, at public health, uh, in education, et cetera, absolutely matter. Um, that also includes our interpersonal communication, right? And so that's really important to think about. When we talk about um, you know, any of these things, I, I am sure some of you are gonna actually be thinking about your personal life. Um, I know that that comes up for lots of folks. We kind of come here with a professional hat on and we end up thinking about our friend or our community or maybe even a family member. And so one of the things that we always talk about even when I train in mental health first aid or if I train you know train in grief one of the things that we talk about is is we have impact and we know that we have impact through our neurology and so we'll talk about mirror neurons in a little bit um, and, and systems have a role in allowing for the time and space for interpersonal communication and healing so one of the things we do is we've got to really think about um, reopening, right? And we've got to think about this collective trauma that we've been going through. What are, what are some very serious considerations and changes we might need um, in order to make sure that our systems are welcoming and healing? Um, uh, oh, uh, Jacqueline, yes, uh, virtual learning. Yeah, we'll talk a little bit about that um, maybe when we get to neurobiology, but you might also want to think about um, joining workshop number two, where we're going to do um, that conversation about toxic stress management, because that's much more on the individual level, and that may definitely be helpful when we're thinking of how to support children. Um, I, have, uh, I have three sons, um, one of whom is a senior in high school right now. And so I, I can relate, like there's been a lot going on, right? Where um, we're watching the young people in our homes be very deeply impacted by this experience, in some ways positively perhaps, in other ways challenging. And so how, how do we as parents interrelate? Um, that may be a helpful workshop for you at some point. Um, so, uh, so Angie, no, it's not really rooted in child development per se. Um, when we teach about, uh, when I teach about mental health first aid for young people, which is for adults supporting youth, we talk a lot more about childhood development. Um, what I can say is that there are slightly different responses, of course, based in developmental stage, right? So if you've got a background in childhood development, you're probably going to be thinking about that. Or if you work with young people, trauma-informed practice might look slightly different for someone who's like 10 or 11 years old versus someone who's 40. Um, so because they may, for instance, define safety differently or what inclusion and empowerment look like. So um, this isn't specifically rooted in 
child development, but you could merge those two concepts together. And definitely um, we can sort of think about like, how would this apply to kids? If you, if you see something on the slides that are coming where you're like, how would that apply to a kid? Let me know, okay? So this is a common definition of trauma. It's the one that we use in TIS uh, training. And uh, you know, I'm just kind of curious in the Q and A, um, what are some words that kind of stand out to you about this definition? Anything kind of jump out and say like, wow, I think that's kind of important or maybe something I hadn't considered before. Lasting. Yeah, Jackie, absolutely. So uh, this is one of those situations where we know that people are experiencing lasting adverse effects over time. Um, and again, that's part of the reason why we're concerned about this with um, health outcomes, things like hypertension and heart disease, right? Like that's a lasting adverse effect. Correct. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so Marissa, that it's experienced by the individual. Everyone's experience of trauma is unique. Um, so some brains are going to be, you know, traumatized in certain situations and other brains walk away from that and, and it didn't have as much impact. Uh, we know for certain that childhood adversity and trauma in childhood um, is definitely very impactful because that brain is still developing. So that's something that we really want to consider. Yeah, Michelle, physically, emotionally, sometimes we forget that trauma is a holistic experience. We sometimes think it's physical, right? Like, oh, that was a physical trauma. But this is mental. It's emotional. I would even add in spiritual for many people, right? Um, so it's really important that we consider that and, and have respect for the variety of impact that an individual could feel uniquely. Um, yeah, and political trauma, Valerie, absolutely. Um, you know, you, you're going to hear a little bit more about that when we get to historical trauma. Um, but yeah, I mean, political trauma, intergenerational trauma, historical trauma. One of the things I like about this definition is sometimes, don't we just think of trauma as like an event? like one thing that happened and then like everybody kind of moved on, um, you know, uh, that's not the experience for many people. Sometimes what they're experiencing is a set of circumstances that are traumatic. Um, and so, for example, again, that's why things like white supremacy and institutional racism are so damaging. Um, that's why if I'm maybe non-binary identifying or trans identifying or I identify LGBTQ+, and I walk into a clinic and I feel unwelcome and like maybe I'm not going to get the health care I need, that's causing a very different stress response than someone like me who's white from Michigan, female, cisgender. I walk into a clinic thinking someone's going to help me, right? So that stress response is really important for us to, to think about. And it's a set of circumstances. It's systemic. And so that if I also happen to have an individual experience of trauma, that set of circumstances exacerbates my brain stress response. It makes it harder, it makes it harder for me to find safe space and safe relationship to heal. Um, and thank you, Jennifer. Like, I, I agree. Um, the brain is completely overwhelmed right? Like it's completely overwhelmed and literally overwhelmed with its response, its chemical response. And so it's really important for us to understand that. The other thing is that oftentimes don't we stigmatize the reaction, right? So someone gets overwhelmed with these stress chemicals. Um, they're having this experience of being completely, um, you know, sort of knocked offline. Um, and, and, you know, then we stigmatize the behavior that comes afterwards on top of that, right? So we know um, that the experience of trauma is twofold. One is the experience itself. And then the second piece is connected to that sense of vulnerability. Um, did I have autonomy in the situation or not? 
Uh, could I do something about it? Or was I overwhelmed by the situation? And so we know that a sense of helplessness and the experience of trauma actually deepens the neuropathway in the brain of that event. So you see my little picture there. That's another reason why childhood adversity is so um, difficult for the brain to manage because on top of um, having an experience of trauma, the it, also little ones, what can they do about it, right? Like it's automatically connected to that sense of overwhelm, that sense of helplessness, because they're tiny, they're little, they can't change what's going on in the home. And so we know that that has a, a much deeper groove in the neural pathways. The other thing is that um, you know, the other sort of secret piece of this, particularly again in childhood, is that very often if I'm a little one and I'm on the receiving end of a bunch of stuff that's going on in the adult world, there's no one there to co-regulate. Right. So one of the things that happens in the brain, um, you know, we've got lots and lots of studies, for example, that have put um, mothers and babies in MRI scans together and we see that they fire in the same spot. And what's happening is when that baby is picked up and is experiencing stress, we teach it how to self-soothe. So shh, 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 that's okay, that's okay. That's teaching that little brain how to regulate itself, how to get itself out of the stress response. But this little one here in the picture, there's no one there to help co-regulate, right? There's no one there to pick up and teach how to soothe. And so that's part of some of the maladaptive behaviors we see is that little one then trying to figure out how to do that for themselves, um, oftentimes, you know, translating into some of those lasting adverse effects, right? Impacts on relationship, maybe impact on the ability to bond, impact on the ability to trust. Maybe I used to hide in the closet right? And so now uh, when, when there's a situation and it feels like a conflict, maybe I'm conflict averse. Um, and so there's a lot of connection here between that sense of overwhelm, the lack of co-regulation while the trauma is being experienced, as well as that sense of helplessness. Yeah. And I, you know, absolutely, Camille, like uh, everybody's resilience is different, right? People's capacity um, to move on is, is part of a lot of different factors. We do know that having connection to people and spaces that feel safe can help heal the brain even in childhood. And so that's part of the reason we are so interested in systems because even if there's a situation at home, maybe where there's a sense of unsafety, um, we could create, for instance, a safe classroom, a safe school, right? And so systems have this very important role to play in actually trying to intervene and help the brain heal if, even if it's had an experience of trauma in the past. We know that this is widespread. Um, we knew this before COVID. Um, the adverse childhood community or adverse childhood experience scales, um, you know, those have been start, you know, there's been research done. And, you know, for instance, where I live in California, um, some of the studies that were done said it was 65% or more of all adult Californians had one or more adverse childhood experience. So we know that um, these experiences are fairly ubiquitous. Um, we also know that they impact certain people more than others. Uh, that can come in a variety of forms. It can come from individual trauma, so that experience of something in the home, but it also may be those sets of circumstances. So again, if I am part of a marginalized community, maybe I'm experiencing trauma in different places than other folks are. The other thing is we know certain occupations are going to expose us to higher um, you know, rates of things like vicarious trauma and secondary trauma. So that's absolutely something we need to consider as well, or like there are certain professions where we know that we are going to experience um, those secondary traumas, those vicarious traumatizations. And we've got to have some systems in place where how we take care of ourselves internally is also trauma and informed. Sometimes we think about trauma-informed practice as an organization, and we're only thinking about our outward-facing activities, right? 
And then we wonder why we have such high turnover and burnout in our own staff. It's because a lot of times organizations are like, we need trauma-informed practice. And they're only talking about their students or their clients or their patients. And they forgot about all of us doing the work. And so what we also need to do is to really imagine what are the what are the vicarious traumatizations that our workforce are experiencing that may inhibit their ability to be trauma informed with their patients, their clients, their students, whoever it is they're serving. So if you are a decision maker and you are in this webinar, if you oversee people, you manage people, um, this is really important for you to consider because you're gonna wanna be thinking about some of these systems um, guidelines that we're gonna go over, not just in your outward facing work, but also in the work that you do um, supporting the people in your own workforce. These are some terminologies that um, I like to just put up there because I'm throwing stuff out there and some of us may know this stuff like the back of our hand and others may not. So I always like to make sure that we've got some common ter terminology. You've heard me speak of adverse childhood experiences. Um, it, you know, that work is really um, very prevalent, for instance, again, in the state of California, certainly in other states as well. Um, you know, for, if for instance, in California, our Surgeon General, our very first Surgeon General in the state of California, Dr. Nadine Burke Harris, um, she has set a goal for the state of California of reducing childhood experiences um, by 50% by the year 2050. And that's going to take a holistic approach. It includes things like universal screening for ACEs. It includes trauma-informed practice in schools. It's going to be talking about things like parenting classes and uh, prenatal interventions and all sorts of things. Um, but you're seeing more and more often where the conversation about childhood adversity is setting these goals and these metrics of reduction because we do know that there are such strong connectors to, to other health outcomes. And so um, that was really the impetus uh, for the interest of Dr. Burke Harris was thinking about why are the children in my clinic responding to some of my treatments and other kids aren't? Um, for instance, if I'm treating their asthma. And so it's one of the things we've got to consider. We know that, um, I, you know, I mentioned vicarious trauma and things like that. Toxic stress is another thing that we're talking a lot about right now, um, just because of, of life and, and what's happening to all of us. And, um, you know, one of the things that we know about toxic stress is that we're getting exposed to an awful lot of cortisol. Um, cortisol is a great chemical, but overexposure to it is not a great thing for our body over the long term. So um, we definitely want to be thinking when we talk about toxic stress management of how can I reduce the amount of cortisol that's in my body? That's kind of the premise for when I talk about managing toxic stress. I always find this little diagram kind of helpful in thinking about um, the multiplicity of experiences that people have. We know, um, obviously, there was all of this activity and research going on about ACEs and adverse childhood experiences. And there were a bunch of people raising their hands saying, hey, like that's not the whole story. There's a bunch of us out here dealing with other types of toxic stress and trauma that we don't see represented in the ACE scores. And so now you're seeing more research in adverse community experiences, adverse community environments. What's in this diagram is by no means an exhaustive list. So I don't see lots of things represented in the communities that I serve. Um, and so one of the things we want to do is to continue the research and have more and more conversation where we can look at the neurobiological impact of these adverse community environments, adverse community experiences. Um, so, I, you know, things about like how we know how poor housing, for instance, can affect things like asthma, right? We've got lots of good data for that. What we're now doing is we're calling for data to say, well, how does that same situation of poor housing actually change my brain? Um, particularly, again, if I'm young and experiencing maybe other things going on in my environment as well. 
Yes, Valerie, absolutely. There are there are so many things that I would add here. Um, there's lots and lots of stuff that I would add here for sure. I'm sure you guys throw some in chat because like there's a lot going on in the world that I think we could we could add to um, adverse community environments. And again, this is this is just an emerging um, conversation. I'm grateful for its emergence. Um, but yeah, absolutely, gender discrimination, right? Like totally a huge issue. We know, for instance, that the suicide rates for trans and non-binary identifying folks are very, very high. Um, the CDC and the census just partnered together last year in 2020 and did added some questions to the census. And we got a lot of information about people's thoughts of suicide. One of the ones that stuck out to me is it was, uh, it was 75 percent of black trans identifying young people between 18 and 25 had seriously considered suicide in the last four weeks right like that's an unbelievable number and it speaks to the fact that we don't have enough data about adverse community environments for that population right we don't have enough data about how schools as a system are exacerbating that problem. And so absolutely, there's tons and tons of stuff here. I really appreciate you guys like coming in here with some of these experiences. Cause yeah, I don't see a lot of things represented in the same way um, that we would want them to, to be more inclusive. This is a start, but we know that we've got more work to do. The, the way that I think about those, um, some of those community or systems trauma is that they're insidious. And I almost think of it like, uh, you know, the reason I have this picture on here is because I think of it as like drip, drip, dripping of water, right? Like it's just constant. It's there all the time. If I can't, you know, go outside of my home and feel safe at the park, if I can't go to my school and feel like I'm not gonna get jumped, if I can't go to the clinic and feel as though someone's gonna really listen to me and to my concern. It's just drip, 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 drip. And that stress response is just firing really consistently. And we know that that has such a tremendous disproportionate effect on our health. And that's what we talk about when we're talking about historical trauma, right? We're talking about intergenerational trauma that's both environmental and biological. We know now that we pass trauma on in our DNA. So there, you know, for certain populations of people who have experienced both individual and or those adverse community experiences, we're passing that on. We may pass on behaviors um, to try to stay safe in these environments. Um, and, and uh, you know, that's intergenerational too. And so one of the things that we've got to start thinking about is what can systems do to address this, right? Where do we have work that needs to be done to ensure, remember our overarching goal, right? Was to make sure that our systems offer wellness and resilience and safety to all people in the community um, because all people have a right to brain healing. And so we've got to be able to talk about historical trauma in systems. Um, and that can be a very uncomfortable conversation um, that, you know, again, when we want to make it them and not us, no, this is our system too. This is our organization too. How do we need to address this to make sure that every single person who walks through that door has an opportunity to be healed here as opposed to re-traumatized? And we know how many people, this is not an exhaustive list by any you know, stretch of the imagination. There's only so much room on my slide, but we get a sense of how systems in particular re-traumatize certain folks more than others. Um, I, you know, I, like, again, I'm a white lady, cisgender. I grew up in Michigan. I even drive a Subaru. That's how white I am. And I, you know, the reality is I walk around with a lot less stress than a lot of other people. Um, and, and that comes from my privilege. That comes from the assumption that I can call 911 and be safe. It calls with the assumption that I can have my you know, son in school and that's gonna be fine and he'll be respected by the teachers. And so one of the things that we have to address is also um, what are the ways in which 
our organization may not be treating people with equity. And that can be a very, very difficult conversation. Nobody ever said being trauma-informed or having trauma-informed practice was gonna be easy. This is gonna to lead to some difficult conversations within the organization. Uh, you'll see a lot of conversations right now in organizations about diversity, equity, and inclusion, DEI efforts, right? For me, they have to have a trauma-informed approach. The DEI efforts that aren't addressing the systemic trauma, they're, you know, they're not fully acknowledging the impact of that uh, you know, set of circumstances on different people within the organization. And again, a lot of organizations are gonna look at diversity, equity, inclusion practice as an outward facing you know, sort of event, but what are we doing internally as well to make sure that we've got people um, who are feeling welcome and okay within the organization itself. Um, and that's absolutely so important for us to consider, right? Um, I, we know I've mentioned this, so I won't spend much time here, but because we know that trauma is, uh, you know, absolutely connected to the six leading causes of death, does it really surprise us that we have other types of health disparities? right? Like, gee, I wonder why we have high rates of hypertension in a certain community or high rates of diabetes. Now, it's not the only social determinant. It could be access to healthy food. It could be, you know, education levels. There's lots of other stuff going on too, but trauma absolutely is contributing to those health disparities. And so, you know, if our organization is health connected at all, we absolutely have to consider trauma as one of the things we need to address. This definition of toxic stress and sort of thinking about this, I like this little, this little you know, visual, even though it's kind of silly. Um, the, the stress chemicals that we're talking about, I'm sort of demonizing them, but we need them. Um, you know, cortisol, for instance, cortisol is a good thing. Not only does it help protect me from a tiger or bear, um, but it gets me up in the morning. Like it's the thing that when it hears the alarm, like it says, hey, Brooke, get up, you know? And I say, okay, and I go get my coffee. So it's a really good thing. We need it. And it actually helps us if we have a balance of the amount of stress chemicals we have through our day, it helps us sort of be at really peak performance. I'm answering emails. I got this. My hair's cute. Like life is good. I'm doing it, right? Well, that like, if I get too much of that stress chemical, what starts to happen is I actually become dysregulated. And so we see, for instance, lots of interruptions in things like concentration, focus, right? So let's bring this to a school setting. Why might we want to have a trauma-informed practice in school? Well, because if I, if I'm, you know, exposing that young person to too much cortisol, how are they going to do on their algebra test? Right. And so one of the things we have to consider is some of these chemicals are good and beneficial to the body when they're in balance, we get too much of it and we start to see issues, not just behavioral, but also just in terms of our overall performance. And so that's one of the things we need to consider as well. Um, anybody here like have days during COVID where you feel like on top of it and other days where it feels like you're in a fog? Right. Or you're just like, oh my gosh, I can't like, I, I, where is this? Or I was started that, or I walked into the room and I, now I don't know. A lot of that is if you're managing too much cortisol, you're corner, you're kind of in that state of dysregulation, um, something to consider and to show ourselves some self-compassion on the days when we may be really struggling with toxic stress. We feel a little like we're out of it, right? And like, what the heck is the matter with me? And we judge ourselves and we're self-critical. A lot of that is because we're managing too much stress and that's just the brain's reaction to, to that cortisol. So let's be nice to ourselves when we're having those, those days where we're feeling a little out of it. This is such an important slide because one of the things that we know is that there are reactions to trauma. There's reactions to this toxic stress. We often think of fight, flight, and freeze. I want to add fawning on here, um, it, you know, at which people often think of like appeasement or people pleasing. Um, you know, it's really important. This is just a reaction of the brain right? This is just the brain doing brain stuff. And yet we still very much stigmatize these reactions. So maybe someone has a fight, 
response and we say, oh, they're violent. You know, someone has a freeze response and we're like, if you really didn't like it, you would have fought back. Um, someone has a fawning response and we're like, oh, you know, that's a, that's just a codependent relationship, right? Fawning is if I do this for this person, do I get to be safe right now? Um, it, it's a form of sort of like appeasement or people pleasing. It's really intended if the bear is coming toward me, maybe if I throw in my backpack with the snacks in it, I can run away and be safe, right? So it's sort of like, hey, here you go. Um, but in our personal relationships, that can be really tricky, right? And a lot of us inherit skills of fawning people pleasing so that we can be safe and that can take a real toll on our spiritual trauma um, because we've inherited all these different people pleasing activities and that can be really complicated for us to disengage from so i just want to add that one in there we tend to think mostly about fight and flight but there are other reactions the brain has as well um and and we just need to normalize these remember um we talked about how we're going to normalize some of these experiences. Normalizing the brain's reaction is, is really important. The other thing is like, we don't have a choice. Your brain picks it. You don't have a choice what, what's going to happen. And I, you know, that's a really important thing to, to remember. Um, brains, brains aren't sitting there contemplating like, hmm, I wonder what I should do. Um, the body reacts and it's really important for us to understand how that brain is reacting so that we can have more compassion for what the response was. Um, Angie, there's a lot of things I would recommend for folks with a fawning response. Um, I definitely, uh, I cover that a little bit more again, when we get to that deeper dive on toxic stress management, um, it's a fawning is a complicated one. It's, it's been socialized. Um, lots of people experience it. Um, it, it, we sort of tend to say, oh, well, that's just like being a nice person, or that's what you're supposed to do. And for some of us that gets complicated. So, um, we talk uh, about those four responses much more when we're talking about toxic stress management, um, just so we can do a deeper dive because people really do want to understand for themselves and the people they serve, or even just the people they support, what are these four things and, and how are they interacting in an organization? Um, so I would say, again, like, come back to workshop two, and, and I got you. Um, so this is like NeuroBio 101. And if you already know this stuff, like, you know, I just hang in there with me a second. Um, but one of the things that we definitely want to think about is what's actually happening in the brain. Um, and so, for instance, this part of the brain is the prefrontal cortex. This is where rational decision making is, executive function. Um, this is where, you know, I, I'm in a history class or I'm finishing something complex, I'm learning something new. This is where language is. And this is a really, you know, a vital part of the brain that makes us human. It's how we are interconnecting, it's how we have a disagreement, it's how we're conceptualizing things. Um, and this part of the brain is the limbic system, and it's really driven by the amygdala, and it's super important for our survival. This is all about emotion and survival. And this, you know, these two parts of the brain usually are in balance and it's not that big of a deal, right? Like we function through the day. Um, that amygdala is taking in information, all of the information around me, right? I'm hearing things, I'm seeing things, I'm smelling things. And it basically is trying to assess for threat. Like, am I safe? Am I safe? Am I safe? Am I safe? And the second the amygdala says, nope, unsafe it releases a bunch of stress chemicals, right? And it gets us ready to have one of those four responses that are intended to keep us safe. So, uh, you know, that emotional survival part of the brain is critical for our survival. The issue is it's supposed to resolve itself fairly quickly and we're supposed to get in balance pr again pretty quickly and it gets sensitized. So what happens is if I'm constantly inundated with things that feel like a threat, that stress response keeps triggering. 
right? And it gets more and more sensitive. So now it needs less stimuli to react. So is anybody like seeing the news or like YouTube or whatever? And it's like people are popping off in Target or Walmart or whatever, like people are just going off. Like that's what's been happening is as we have been dealing with higher levels of cortisol and stress, people, you know, oftentimes say people will say, oh, they got triggered right? Um, in the field, we're working really hard to kind of move away from that word. Um, some folks who have experienced gun violence have, have said that word in and of itself can be really harmful and hurtful. So in trauma-informed practice, we're not saying triggered as much. What we're saying is activated. Um, but the reality is that that's how we think of it, right? Like someone went from zero to 60, um, and it takes less and less for them to get there. And so sometimes what I think about is like maybe, uh, you know, pre COVID or maybe pre trauma, I would have started off at zero and I, you know, it would take me a while to get to 30. Now a bunch of people are starting at 30. And so it doesn't take them much longer to get to 60. And so one of the things that we're seeing for sure is people um, having some fragility around their stress response. They're just more vulnerable to it. Um, and is anybody, a little more irritable, <laughs> popping off a little bit more than before. Anybody experiencing that in your environment, maybe in your work environment, or even with people you know, there's just that stress response is firing more often and it's activating. It's, it's harder and harder to get back to zero, back to your baseline. Uh, you know, when that happens, then that's what we think about when we think about emotional dysregulation. Um, and that's what can lead to some of these behaviors I saw earlier um, in Q&A, like, you know, what about some of those, you know, maladaptive behaviors and some of those dysregulated behaviors? That's where some of this stuff comes comes from, right? Is that stress response is firing, firing, firing. And we might start grabbing for stuff to either feel better um, to try to like, you know, mitigate that, to hide from it and avoid the things that are activating that. Um, and we're developing some, some behaviors um, subsequent to that. And so um, absolutely really critical that we have respect for what's going on in the brain, that we acknowledge what's going on in the brain, um, and that we've got a way to talk about it. Um, and so the metaphor that we use in this curriculum is a rider and a horse, right? Um, where sometimes when we are working with someone and, you know, they clearly have been activated in their stress response, we're still trying to like argue with them rationally, right? We're sitting there saying, oh, but I told you and no, 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 that was misinformation, but your chart is right here. This part of the brain is the rider. This part is the horse. When these things are working in tandem, everything's fine, right? Everything's great. Literally what happens in the stress response is the brain takes resources from this part and it sticks them here, right? You're not talking to the rider anymore. The rider is way back there. Rider got knocked off that horse. And so when we argue with somebody who's been activated, when we're arguing with a student who may have felt disrespected in our classroom, we're trying to rationalize. We're talking to the rider, but the rider is way back there right? Nothing is going to change in this situation. We can't have the same type of dialogue until we get that rider back on the horse. And that's going to be all of our skills of de-escalation, right? So what is the environment that we can create? How do we co-regulate someone back, right? So because otherwise all I'm talking to is a horse and the horse is only cares about survival, right? Like, and, and think of the people that you've seen triggered before, right? Like they, there they go and there's no talking to them, right? Like that's because you're talking to a horse. And if you've ever seen a horse that's been spooked, they don't care. They're not, they're not listening to commands. They're just running back where they're running to the stable and they will knock stuff down. They will knock you down. They're gonna be running all around. Like they absolutely are just about motion and emotion. And so oftentimes a trick that I use is when I'm in a situation, maybe I'm supporting a young person in one of our programs and I see this happening, I'm talking to the horse and I have to talk to a horse in a whole different way, right? Then I'm going to talk to that rider. So I'm going to work really hard in my interpersonal communication 
to de-escalate the situation so that the horse can calm down, gives the rider a back, uh, you know, a chance to get back on board. And then we can talk about that thing that happened back here. Right. But sometimes people make the mistake. Oh, if I can just talk to this person, I'll talk them through it. That doesn't always help. What helps is de-escalating. And the most important thing that we have to consider when we, when we think about that is that we have neurological impact on one another. We have mirror neurons and we literally are wired biologically. Um, and uh, you know that's so important for us to remember. Um, the, the metaphor that I use here is, has anybody had a day where like you are, um, it, like it, it's the best day ever. Your music is on the radio. Your hair looks great. You're like, I got this. Like, you know, all right, today is my day. And you get to work and you see someone in the hallway and they're super negative and their energy is really bad. And you walk away feeling differently than you got to work feeling like there went your good mood. That's this rule, right? We are, we have options about how we are going to positively or negatively impact each other's neurobiology. And so when we talk about the interpersonal communication skills we need, we talk a lot about de-escalation. Um, how do I control my own breathing first so that your breathing can slow down? How do I calm myself down so that you can calm down? That's what co-regulation is. And so one of the things that we have to do is if we're in an environment or in an organization that serves a lot of people who are getting activated, we have to think about what is the training our staff may need in these co-regulation and de-escalation strategies. Because we know we're talking to a bunch of horses a lot of the time. How do we make sure our staff knows how to do that effectively? Um, and so it, you know, just be thinking about other resources and other things. Um, we teach, I teach a couple different workshops just focused on co-regulation and de-escalation. How do we do this so that when someone's activated, we can calm the horse down, get the rider back on, and then address the issue that they are uh, you know, perhaps upset about. One of the things that that does is it just, this is, I think, probably if I had like any kind of thing to say about it, I think this is one of the most important things about trauma-informed practice is instead of saying, what's the matter with this person? I'm asking what happened. Um, what, what's the matter with these people? I, I'm asking what's happened to this community. Um, and that, that simple change in internal dialogue when you're trying to de-escalate a situation, it brings you to a place of compassion. Um, it changes your perspective. It, cha it destigmatizes the reaction that you're seeing. Maybe you're seeing a fight reaction and it can destigmatize that because now I'm walking around that behavior and I'm asking a question of origin. What happened to get us here? Right. And that to me, this question in my mind is one of the most important things that I can do if I'm in a situation where I'm having to co regulate. Um, because I know that reorienting myself around the question, what's happened to them, is going to change how I interact and move forward. So, shifting of perspective is very critical. Um, in my team room, we have this posted everywhere. Everyone, it just says what happened to them, what happened to them, what happened to them, because we know that if we start from there, we are going to have a more empathetic response and we're going to have a, an inherently more trauma informed response by making sure that we start at that question. Then we think of like, okay, there's certain principles of safety and stability and you know empowerment and all of that. Like, what do we have to think of in order to have our organization be trauma informed? Or when we want to say um, we want to have a trauma informed practice, there are certain guiding principles that need to be in place. Safety and stability is one of them. We've already said we're going to capitalize on the brain's ability to heal and its neuroplasticity by connecting to environments and people where we feel safe. So how do we communicate that? Well, the very first thing in our organization we have to think of is we have to acknowledge that safety occurs holistically. So it, safety isn't just about physical safety. A lot of organizations put great time and energy into thinking about physical safety and maybe not as much in emotional safety. 
And so one of the very first things we have to do is look critically at our organization and ask ourselves, even maybe do focus groups or surveys or finding out from the people who engage in our organization, do you feel safe here? Do you feel, do you feel welcome? Do you feel like your concerns are gonna be heard? Um, do you feel that you are represented in the space? Right. Um, these are all ways that we communicate different types of safety outside of simply assuming physical safety is the only thing we need to be concerned about. So um, absolutely. One of the guiding principles and things that you may want to consider is really doing assessment of holistic safety in your organization. Right. How well are we doing the other types of safety? Stability is hard. Um, and again, like I'm not here to tell you this stuff is easy. Uh, stability is darn hard because I know that a lot of the things that we use um, to create these sorts of environments, they come from resource funding streams and resource streams that aren't always stable, right? So maybe we started an amazing restorative justice practice at our school, and now the grant dried up and we can't find more funding for it. And there it goes. And so one of the things I think is one of the most important um, contributions a leader can make in creating safe and stable environments is sustainability. Right? Like, do we have diversified funding streams? Do we have like some discretionary funding? What's my plan for um, trying to cover funding gaps, et cetera? Do I need to advocate for more funding for this thing I want to do to create safety in my environment? This is a definitely, um, if you're a thought leader, a decision maker, you're the money person, this is where your contribution to safety and stability is so key because sustainability, organizational sustainability is really critical. And that's not something that a lot of us on the ground have any control over, right? Um, and it's not even something that leaders have a lot of control over. I'm a leader of an organization. I don't always have control over it, but I know that it's always on my mind because I know that that grant sunsetting could impact negatively the sense of safety and stability that a young person might have in one of my programs. So I always am keeping that in mind. That's one of my leadership contributions to a trauma-informed practice within an organization. One of the other ones that we wanna think about as a core guiding principle is cultural humility and responsiveness. Um, so we really wanna make sure that we have got um, you know, opportunities for people to feel healed and welcomed and as though their, their culture is um, you know, sort of acknowledged and celebrated. Um, not just tolerated. A lot of people walk into systems and they feel like they're getting tolerated. That's not safety and stability. That means like, oh, I don't feel safe here because I'm being tolerated. If you think of your personal experience and someone is sort of looking at you and like showing judgment in their face and kind of like, oh, you know, okay, fine, whatever, you know, you know, you don't feel safe with that person. Uh, you feel judged and you feel unwelcome. And so ultimately, you know, what cultural humility and inclusiveness and all of those aspects of DEI efforts is about feeling welcome. And so what are some things that we can do to support that? Um, the very first is we've got to acknowledge that historical trauma is real. And I get that we're not there yet in a lot of organizations and systems in this country. Um, you know, we are grateful for the increased dialogue, but we're still seeing, you know, all sorts of very real traumas related to things like racism two things like bigotry, two things, like we said earlier, right? Like, you know, um, predatory capitalism, like all of these things that we see that we know are in our systems, the very first thing we've got to do is call it out. Um, and we have to start working together to, to acknowledge the fact that not everyone has felt comfortable in our system. Um, the other thing that we can do is, that's so important is to begin to embed representation. So this is why workforce really matters. People who are at the table um, change systems inherently by being there. So one of the things we can do is to think about DEI efforts in terms of our workforce. Do we have real representation at this table? Um, do we have representation with decision makers? You know, a lot of people will talk about snow-capped organizations, right? All the leadership 
are Caucasian and come from different socioeconomic backgrounds. And then it's all the entry level staff are diverse and come from, you know, black and brown folks or indigenous people, et cetera. Do we have a snow top organization? What can we do to change that? So one of the things that we've got to do is really put time and effort into understanding representation within our organization, because every new voice that is, you know, in that decision making room changes the culture of that organization. So, uh, you know, absolutely critical that we be thinking about, um, you know, how do we make sure that we are not re-traumatizing people. Um, and that's unfortunately what can happen in organizations is that people are being re-traumatized, right? And so one of the things we've got to consider is how representation can change that. Yes, yes, Valerie, exactly. That's the point I'm just trying to make. I, I, you know, I realize that sometimes I use that comfortable and I appreciate you pointing that out. Like we're literally talking about people being re-traumatized or traumatized um, and, you know, absolutely exploitation, erasure, et cetera. Absolutely. Thank you for bringing that point up. Uh, one of the other things that we have to think about is, um, you know, as a core guiding principle in systems is that compassion and dependability. Um, I often think of this as, um, you know, obviously compassion, like thinking about like, how do we have empathy, like all of those sorts of things. But the other thing I often think of is dependability is setting expectations, right? Dependability is I know what I can expect from this environment. Remember, when we talked about um, that stress response, part of it is coming from uncertainty. What's going to happen? What's going to happen? That amygdala is assessing the environment all the time. Am I safe? Am I safe? Am I safe? So things like structure, things like um, very clear expectations, things like very clear policies and procedures, um, it, accountability for those so that people know um, this is going to be equitably applied. Right. So that's a big thing for young people. Um, if they see rules that are applied to some people and not other people, that's going to inherently be traumatizing for them. And so one of the things that we've got to think about in our organizations is, are we equitably setting expectations and applying them and, and being very clear? Communication strategies are huge here. Um, how do we communicate with our workforce? How do we communicate with the people we serve? Do they know that they can come to expect that uh, maybe even something simple like an e-newsletter that comes at the same time, it comes at the same place? It's, that's very reassuring for the brain. Um, when we talk about managing toxic stress, one of the things I talk about is micro routines, literally building routines into your day as a practice of self-care. The reason why is because if you're dealing with a lot of uncertainty, the brain likes those routines. It actually calms down. It likes those. Um, and so it's really, really important that we build those into uh, both our outward facing practices as well as our inward facing practices. So everyone knows what to expect and that can actually help, uh, you know, at least mitigate stress responses based in uncertainty. Um, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. The chain of command. Yes. Um, you know, the trauma informed systems work the way it's really supposed to work is we do training on the ground, right. And sort of this grassroots sort of level, and then leadership are engaged in their own version of that. Um, because there's acknowledgement there that that hierarchical, you know, hierarchical system is inherently a distribution of power. And a lot of what I'm talking about today is based in power, right? Like we're, we're actually having a conversation about power. And so, um, you know, how do we do that in a system? What hierarchy needs to stay, doesn't need to stay? What are, you know, those policies and procedures? What, um, what strengthens the power at the top versus taking away power from the bottom. These are all inherently trauma-informed discussions. So when organizations say we want to have trauma-informed practice, one of the things you're going to end up talking about is power. Um, who has it? Who doesn't get it? Who needs to be at the table? Um, again, these are not easy conversations to have, but they, will, they are trauma-informed discussions. 
you know, we also think of collaboration and empowerment. Um, I, I sort of think of this as voice and choice, and we're sort of talking about it in a way. We're talking about that ability to be represented, the ability to be heard. Um, this is incredibly important in any kind of trauma-informed practice when you're sitting there remembering that people have the experience of having felt helpless, <laughs> right? So, uh, you know, if I have a trauma, either an event, an acute trauma, or I live with chronic trauma or toxic stress related to a set of circumstances in this environment that exacerbate my trauma response. Um, you know, we've said part of that that happens in the brain is a sense of overwhelm and a connection to a sense of helplessness. And so one of the things we want to think about is how can we empower people here? What are decisions that we can uh, allow? Um, and, and I know that this can be difficult. Um, you know, if you're running an organization, stuff still has to get done, right? We need people to do what we need them to do. And there oftentimes, even in small things, is an opportunity to collaborate and empower. Um, an example is I worked with a health system recently. Um, it was a, a psychiatric health system. And uh, one of the trauma-informed practices they'd been working on for some time was they wanted to change how often they were using restraints. Um, so people come in at a very high level of acuity and they wanted to not use restraints as often. And they had made amazing progress with that. They had come you know, to have all sorts of different um, you know, te techniques and strategies and all of these sorts of things. And when COVID hit, um, their use of restraints went up 400% in, in six weeks because people um, who were coming in at the higher levels of crisis and with everything going on, um, then they had PPE to consider, right? Like that was something that before wasn't as big of an issue, but now it was a really big issue. I can't have someone pulling at my, you know, mask or pulling at, you know, the, the gown I've got on to protect myself. And so um, we walked, you know, into how are we going to get to a position where we can think about um, trauma-informed practice and giving empowerment here and, and collaborating with the folks coming in to both protect the employees as well as give some choice. And so um, we worked for a month on that. <laughs> it was not an easy conversation. We had to really think outside the box. How can we still make sure that everyone is safe and meet this trauma-informed goal of not using restraints as often. And so sometimes a trauma-informed practice gets down to that level of granularity, right? Maybe you're looking at a particular policy or particular procedure. Um, one of the ways that I often talk about this as well is to make sure that people have that place at the table. So, um, you know, we don't serve people without hearing from them about how we're doing. Um, now, at schools that may be listening to student feedback and focus groups, listening to parents and families about this wor is working for us, that's not working for us, having open, open public dialogue, perhaps, um, you know, opening up our board meetings, um, recording webinars and recording some of the things we're doing so people have access to that. Um, it's, it's about bringing people in, the people that we serve in, and making sure that they have an opportunity opportunity to be a part of our solution-driven practice. Um, and so it's really, really important that we think about that because remember, every time we offer that sense of empowerment, that sense of autonomy and decision-making, a sense of collaboration with an organization, what we're really doing is we are, we're combating that sense of helplessness that came from the trauma. Um, and so that's an incredibly powerful neurological intervention is to give people that sense of voice and choice in organizations. The, you know, the truth of the matter is that many, many people have, um, you know, their trauma comes at the hands of other people. And so when we think about healing from trauma, we really are talking about relationships. Um, we are talking about designing organizations that, that foster deep connection and deep relationship with the people we serve. And that can be easier said than done. One of the things I think is a huge hindrance in many of our organizations is time. 
we, we just go, 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 go. We often don't have the time in our work environments to do this work, to really connect, to give space for someone. Um, it can be very, very difficult. I used to run a neurological practice and I, you know, the, the neurologists that I work with, um, they had 15 minutes for a follow-up appointment, 20 minutes for a new consult. Like, how do I get to know a person, understand their neurology, understand their, you know, their symptoms, you know, talk to them, maybe do some education, connect with them on a human level, write up the chart, like do all this stuff in a 20 minute new, new consult appointment. Like that's, it's difficult to even imagine that. Right. So one of the things that we can do is to ask ourselves, are there some changes that we can make that allow us time, the luxury of time? Um, because relationships are what are going to be healing for people. Um, the, we can relearn how to trust. We can relearn how to feel safe. We can relearn appropriate boundaries. We do that in connection with other people. We don't do that in a vacuum. And so one of the things that we have to consider is, is our organization making space for that human connection? Do we have the time, the space, the resources to allow our people to connect with the people we serve? Um, is, there, is there a way that we can add in some of that time? Um, how am I doing that at, for myself in whatever my role is in the organization? And how is the system um, allowing me to do that or not? One of the things that I think of too is that um, people operating within systems are, are operating within the confines of that system, right? And so really important that we, if we are decision makers, if we're leaders, we're looking at how, how is the time spent here? Um, could we release some here? Could we reevaluate there? Could I put some FTE over here? Because one of the things that we want to consider is that that is going to also have impact on the vicarious trauma of our workforce. Um, incredibly traumatic to be seen one person after another, after another, after another, particularly now with everything that folks are walking in with, um, it, you know, seeing those people one after another, after another, without even space to process that. So one of the things we think of too, when we work with organizations on really embedding trauma-informed policies and procedures internally is how's my staff doing? Um, do they have enough time to connect? Are they really, um, you know, able to connect with themselves? Are they still feeling passion about the work? And time is a huge factor in that. You know, we know that we need people. And, you know, even if we're introverted, I'm an introvert and I need less people than other people do, but I still need people. And, uh, you know, right now, especially, um, we need people more than ever because we haven't been able to be around them. And so um, as, this is one of the things that we really need to think about is as we open up, what are ways that we can um, interconnect again? What are some of the ways that we need to be thinking about how we're gonna make time and space to heal together as an organization? We've, we've all been through this thing. Um, we're seeing upticks, for instance, in social anxiety. People who are coming out, right, with a lot of anxiety, a lot of trepidation, um, we've all been stuck inside for, for a lot of our time, right? And so our, our little social sphere has gotten pretty small. We see each other this way, right? In little squares. I mean, my goodness, how many people do we see every day like that? Um, but, I, you know, we aren't really interconnecting. And there are different parts of the brain that fire when we're in person versus on camera. Um, that's a really important thing. In fact, one of the most important senses that we have when we're connecting to other people is smell, right? So smell is very deeply rooted in the brain and memory. Uh, you know, that's how um, we recognize babies and it's how we recognize intimate partners. It's a very primal thing. It's a very primal sense of smell. And so we're not smelling a lot of people right now. Um, and that has impact, even if we're on Zoom and connecting, it's good, but it's not as good as in person. And so 
we know that as we start to open up, people have increased levels of social anxiety. There's going to be a lot of stuff going on with them when they come in. We don't always necessarily know what has happened. We can't always assume that people have been sheltered in safe environments. And so one of the things we're going to have to really consider as we reopen is how do we, we allow for a lot of time and space to process and to heal so that we can recommit ourselves to collective norms moving forward. Um, absolutely critical that we do that because we know that folks are gonna be coming in in all different kinds of ways. I always like to end on this little uh, video. If any of you know Brene Brown, um, you know that she's a sociology researcher um, out of Texas. And um, I just find her work really interesting. She does a lot of stuff on um, complex concepts, things like vulnerability. She's got a great TED talk on vulnerability um, if, you, if you are interested in her. Um, and, uh, you know, absolutely, uh, you know, check her out on TED. She's got some podcasts that she's been doing recently that are really interesting. Um, but I like to make sure that I end on this because, um, oh, thanks, Elizabeth. <laughs> yeah, I really like her too. Um, I, you know, I love this short little video because I think it, she doesn't frame this as a trauma informed practice, but it very much is at the heart and in the soul of everything that we're talking about today. Um, so let's just go ahead and watch this and, and let's see what you think. So what is empathy and why is it very different than sympathy? Empathy fuels connection. Sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's a, it, very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions where empathy is relevant and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. <laughs> recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, you climb down. I know what it's like down here and you're not alone. Sympathy is, Ooh, it's bad, uh-huh. Uh, no, you want a sandwich? Um, empathy is a choice and it's a vulnerable choice because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. I had a, yeah. And we do it all the time because you know what? Someone just shared something with us that's incredibly painful and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. Oh, at least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. <laughs> John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. So I just love to, to finish on that because I think it's so important um, for us to, you know, trauma-informed practice is not intended to take away the trauma. The trauma happened. The trauma may still be happening. However, the brain can relearn to connect if it has those safe relationships, those safe spaces. 
Um, and so one of the things that is so important is a lot of us who are in caring professions, we try to fix it. We try to make it better. We try to, as she said, as Brene Brown said, put the silver lining on it. Um, yeah, maybe your childhood was hard, but you can pull yourself up. And if you just get to college or, yeah, I know that thing happened, but it, we just, you know, we're going to be, or maybe we say, we just ignore it. We grieve alone. We stigmatize that thing. So we're, you know, people are grieving alone or we are in situations where we just don't have the conversation. So the reality is that the things that folks have gone through, they've gone through. We can't take that away with our approach. We can't take that away with a systems change. What can change, however, is the context in which they get to heal. And does everyone get access to that healing equitably, right? Does everyone get access to that safety and security equitably? That's the driving question behind trauma-informed practice is, uh, you know, can we give people the space, the time, the relationships necessary to capitalize on their inherent resilience, the inherent ability of the brain to heal and create spaces where they could be transformed, right? So trauma-informed practice is a way to start that dialogue. It's a way to get that ball moving down the field um, to help us create those spaces. But ultimately the goal is to have human connection within those spaces, within those organizations, because that's what's really going to heal, right? So this idea that the system can fix it, that's not true. This idea that I personally can fix it, even if I'm a really amazing person, that's not true. But what can fix it to, to you know, Brene's point is human connection. And so do our organizations allow for that or not? Um, are we, are we um, re-traumatizing or are we offering transformation? And so in my personal opinion, that video does a great job of sort of synthesizing the ultimate goal of trauma-informed practice, which is human connection. So I would like to uh, you know, offer you the last couple of minutes if there's any questions or anything like that that you've got. Um, I know that there, it's an awful lot to cover. I'm sure I can't answer everything, but if you've got a question, um, pop it into the q and I'll do my best um, to answer it. Um, Anna, I see that you're asking um, about training for supervisors. Um, so I do do a training that's really specific to supervisors. Um, that really is um, important because there are different things we may want to consider. In fact, when I do trauma-informed training, I do supervisors and staff separately because that gives staff an opportunity to sort of like really say what they want to say without somebody on the Zoom who's like looking at them. Um, and supervisors may have some concerns or some interest areas or even some pressures that staff don't really understand. So we do definitely um, use uh, you know, that opportunity to work with supervisors in particular. Um, yeah, absolutely. And trauma-informed practice for supervisors is very, very important. Um, Oh, I love that you guys are putting in some other opportunities to, um, you know, make sure that you've got, uh, you know, different resources and things like that. I love that. Um, it, so, Danielle, we're going to put up those next sessions for you in just a second. Um, someone's going to pop on and do that for you. So we're going to get um, going to get you that information. Um, and then Jackie, what are some of the best ways uh, to do that empowerment? I just think of voice and choice. Right, like where in everything that I do, when can I give opportunities um, for you know for voice and choice? Where can I make sure that folks have the capacity um, to to express themselves? Right? When do when do we make sure that we are um, you know really making sure that people have that? Um, do do I do I have things like advisory councils? Um, do I have things like focus groups? Is is my work informed by the people I serve? Those are some of the things that I kind of think about when I'm really looking at empowerment in an organization. Um, so I see a question about. Um, other than empathy, dealing with clients or staff who've overdosed or struggled with substance use to address grief. Um, yeah, so that's a big one. Uh, grief is, I think, grief is actually what started my journey in this field, um, because I think that grief is sort of 
the the hidden issue in a lot of people. Um, so we have some um, some trainings and things like that that are just grief driven, talking about grief. What are some things that are helpful and unhelpful? And when I say grief, I just want to be really clear with everyone that I mean that outside of bereavement alone. Bereavement is obviously someone died, but there are lots and lots of things that we grieve that aren't coming from death. Um, and, and those need to be addressed in our systems as well. So um, what I can do is I can go ahead and talk to some of the leadership of, of NOPEN and see maybe we could offer a grief workshop in the future. If anyone's interested, um, put that in your evaluation of today's session and, and I can see um, if there's some way that we can, can get that on the books as well. So I can see that we've got the um, other opportunities. So our next workshop is gonna be the 12th. Um, and so I hope to see many of you there. Um, I always, uh, you know, am, am open. So please, uh, you know, make sure that you let Nopen know if you need to get a hold of me or if you have other questions or things like that, they can make uh, my contact information available to you. Okay. 